Okay, so thanks everyone. Uh, I'll talk about uh, uh, this is a paper I, I did. Uh, well, well, I guess about a year ago when I was in New York working on a stage make in AWS. Um, anyway, I'll get started. So I'll breeze through this because you know we talked about this a lot now. Uh, Tabular data is data in a table, right? It has columns, which could be of, of various types, right? And at least for the purpose of this talk, I'm, I'd am i like to predict one column given the rest, right? Uh, this could be classification or regression, or, well, other stuff they don't want to talk about. Now, <clears throat> how do you do this, at least in deep networks, and, and this, this this is kind of true for not deep networks as well. You have to move to numbers because deep networks at the end of the day manipulate numbers, right? So, you know, numeric are fine, categorical. What do you do? Usually use uh, like a standard embedding layer. Every category gets a vector. And then you have other types like image, text, audio. Uh, I won't get into that, but you know, there's a vast literature on, on the embedding they get, right? Now that you have your embedding, you plug this into a neural network and you know you can back crop and you know your way to success, right? So this is really the topic of, of this paper. It's what do you do with categorical variables, right? It's this component, the standard embedding, it it has a lot of friction. And you know, we, we just try to give something a little better, easier to use performs better. Okay, so what are these frictions? What's what's the big deal with, with you know categorical features? So first of all, sometimes you have rare categories. You just see it, you know, two examples of them. What kind of embedding would that get? So how do I even identify them? Is it two? Is it five? Is it ten? Right? And then, and then what do I do with them? You know, there's there's like a bunch of solutions and, and it's not really clear. Um, now I have similar categories. If you start with a random embedding, then you know eventually, you know, if you have an infinite amount of data, no worry, you learn. But maybe you can exploit that from some external source. The fact that they are similar and and you know get a head start. And okay, well, exploiting data from other sources is is you know is something that is a must have in other, uh, I guess, uh, other works on deep learning, you know, image, text, and anything we could do for Tabular there would be amazing, right? We wanted some aspect of that. Uh, and finally, context. But in a toy example, you know, I have uh, animal and age, right, in my, in my data set. Can I have a, a puppy, a two-month-old dog, have a different embedding than a, you know, an older 12-year-old dog, right? So apparently, we're not the first people to realize, you know, first community, to be more exact, to realize that these are like frictions and issues. And NLP actually, well, they're dealing with this for a while, right? They have infrequent words with similar demeaning, everybody is using, using pre-trained models, right? And contextual embeddings are also, you know, known to be very efficient. And contextual, I mean, look at the other words. So the word bank would get a different embedding in the sentence river bank than Bank of America. Okay, so onto the design of the well, component. So in here, you know, I'm looking at a, a table with columns, job, marital status, and education. And you know, consider this first row: unemployed, married, and primary. Right. So every you know every category here, every variable gets an embedding. You know, unemployed gets this first layer is you know a standard embedding layer. My embedding is starts from an embedding from the particular category unemployed and an embedding for the entire column job. Same here, an embedding for married and an embedding for the entire column, and so on. Now I take these initial, these are not contextual, they're just embeddings. But this part actually helps with infrequent categories 
because you know if I regularize it, then you know categories that don't appear, they're just going to get like a zero vector here, and I'm just going to use the embedding of the entire column, right? Now, next step is uh, self-attention. So if you don't know what that is, I won't get into it, but it's basically a way to mix all these embeddings together in a data-dependent way. And, you know, the output, these are the contextual embeddings. Okay. Now, that's one component. What do you do with it? If you have more data, not just your data, you have unlabeled data, related data, then, well, uh, you, we borrowed, you know, again, borrowed from uh, LP. There's math language model. Basically, you, you train in a self-supervised way. You insert, you know, you erase some categories, try to reconstruction. That's math, MLM, that's math language model. Or you replace values with random other values and try to detect which category was replaced with a random one. This is replaced token detection. And the embeddings you get are, are well, a good head start. Right now, that was a component for your categorical data, right? This part. You need to plug this into another network that handles the whole thing. Uh, in all our experiments, we chose uh, MLP, but really, like, I guess any any other. Oh, I don't know if you can see this. Okay, any design tool, right? Doesn't have to be an MLP to make the comparison clean. It's an MLP. Okay. So on to some experiments. Um, first of all, kind of verified, do these contextual embeddings mean a bit more? So we have three plots here. The left one is for our network. Then we have for uh, the bottom layer of our network, so no contextual yet, or an MLP. And in this data set bank marketing, we, okay, I guess you can't see this, but uh, <laughs> you'll have to trust me, a TSNE plot, Kind of clusters nicely. There's reasonable clusters of, of the different categories of the different, like the different values, they kind of cluster nicely. And in the other two, there's no structure. They're just all over the place. It's more of, I guess, sanity check. Now another sanity check, well, I guess it connects well to the previous talk. Uh, just compare the performance on a uh, fully supervised standard setting, right? Um, well, we did well. We did better than the other, uh, like the baseline networks. We did beat XGBoost, <laughs> right? What are you gonna do? Uh, but then again, you know, we're at least on par, right? And and there are these added values, added, you know, advantages. Now, um, I guess second second uh, another experiment for noisy data. We took some of the values and replaced them with random ones. So it's an animal, I just replace it with a random animal. Let's see what happens, right? And we perform better than, you know, without this component. And moreover, the degradation is, is, is slower. So, you know, we suffer less as you add noise. Same when you just erase categories, replace them to be missing. Um, okay. Okay, finally, uh, semi-supervised setting. Here, we took eight data sets with a lot of data, 30,000 points, but we only gave label to a very small subset, 50 or 200 or 500, right? We pre-trained the contextual embeddings on the whole data set, and then just, you know, use that as a, as a good start for the tiny label data. And we didn't compare against, you know, just supervised methods. We compared against semi-supervised methods. And well, you know, it, it's much better, right? Um, there's more to do when you have very few uh, labeled data. Uh, you know, there's tweaks, like not all the network was, was pre-trained, so there may be some work to be done. In any case, um, I'll just jump to conclude and say this, uh, I encourage people to try it, it works. People implemented this and it's not just me, right? This is other uh, people 
I don't even own them, right? That, that you know, they do this in Keras, in PyTorch. Uh, I do know the people in AutoGluon. It's an AutoML by, by Amazon. Uh, anyway, um, hope you give it a try and be happy to answer any questions.